peppermint oil, if anybody looks into this, uh, some people will use peppermint oil in their house to keep spiders away because spiders do not like the vapors off of peppermint oil. So it's a, it's a, it's a natural bug repellent because essentially what citric acid does is it, it messes up the pH of the uh, powdery mildew mold and uh, things like that. So they, so they basically die and they, the reason they always say to have a pH of 5.5 to 6.5 or whatever the pH recommended range is it has to do with the uptake. It has to do with the water solubility so that it can. One thing with the isopropyl alcohol, which I, I don't know, but I do have controversy around it, is when you look at the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol, it's like 190 degrees Celsius. But yeah. the absolute boiling point is 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and that doesn't get, it doesn't get that hot on the planet. Sure. Have you ever wondered what's in the Lost Coast Gardening Insecticide and Fungicide product? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. You're here with Holt Crowley and Mark Bowell on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to check us out on Instagram and Facebook and hit the notifications for future videos like this. If you haven't checked out our monthly membership, make sure to do so because we have over 110 growers ready and willing to assist you through your growing problems. Let's go ahead and get into the video. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. So I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Holt. Uh, first off, Holt, can you please introduce yourself? Tell us what company you're with. And then also, just because, like I've already said, Holt has one of the highest level of integrities I've ever met around the pesticide fungicide arena, which is there's so much information there, but it's a very untapped, uh, untapped, unspoken uh, area. So because of Holt and his high level of integrity, I've actually started to ask him to come onto the channel and we're going to begin to break down one pesticide and or fungicide at a time so that you guys have a full understanding of what you're putting on your plants and the proper application for these pesticides and fungicides. So Holt, please introduce yourself to the channel. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, my name is Holt Crowder. I work for a company called Organishield, and Organishield happens to be a pest control or an IPM, and it's a EPA registered uh, IPM, which means it's a little different than some of the other ones in that we actually had to prove our results and the EPA gave us a registration versus some of the other products that um, they may be on an exemption list with their ingredients. Very cool. I absolutely love that. Holt, uh, can you please go ahead and share your screen? And sure, sure. So let's go ahead and get into Lost Coast Plant Therapy. What is it all about? Sure, absolutely. Now, Lost Coast Plant Therapy is, I believe they're based in California, and I know they have a pretty big market share in some places. Essentially, we'll go over the ingredients first, and, and then we'll go through the instructions and go a little bit about it. Um, it is another one of the ones that has oils. And this one uh, has soybean oil, and they like to tell you what it does. Um, like I was uh, said in the past on some other uh, other products, that the oil basically coats insects, suffocates the bug, and then they they say they cannot build an immunity to suffocation. I'm not sure if that's true because I've seen oils not you know not work on some mites and things. But but anyway, that's the claim, and their and their their big thing is soybean oil is their main one. The other ingredient um, is peppermint oil, and peppermint oil. If anybody looks into this, uh, some people will use peppermint oil in their house to keep spiders away because spiders do not like the vapors off of peppermint oil. So it's a it's a it's a natural bug repellent. I'm not sure if their thoughts on uh, using this on cannabis were to make a mint flavored like a mint menthol cigarette or something. But but you know it's a, it's basically a uh, a bug repellent, and I'm not you know, necessarily sure why they've used that one. But anyway, the other other thing they have is citric acid, and basically the citric acid again I look at is if you use it correctly, it can be great to stop mold and powdery mold mildew, and that's actually what they make the claim of is that it's for powdery mildew because essentially what citric acid does is it, it messes up the pH of the uh, powdery mildew mold and uh, things like that. So they, so they basically die and they, they can't, uh, they can't survive in a high acidic environment. So again, let me show you what uh, citric acid basically has a pH of below four. Um, so, which is very uh, acidy, as you want to say, um, you know, above seven is alkaline below seven is considered uh, an acid. So, so that's, that's a little bit of the citric acid and then some other inert ingredients you're going to see. One so more thing that I found to be really interesting in the one of the last videos you shot with us, a couple of weeks ago was you told me last time it builds up a little bit in the soil, right? Can you talk yeah, to me sure, a little bit more about that? Sure. Yes, I apologize. Citric acid can build up in your soil. And let me just go back to this again. Um, this is straight from Google. So this isn't my words on citric acid. This is Google. So 
So when applying enough citric acid to plants, water or soil will create an environment unsuitable for the plant. So the, the concern with it, and I'm not gonna tell the poo poo on it, it depends on how you use it, if you use it the right way. But the concern about that is that it's gonna build up into your soil or your grow substrate, whatever you're growing, rock wool. Some people reuse their rock wool and cocoa and they're in their soil. And a lot of people with living soils, I worry more about that for people who are into the, the true organic living soils. Um, because that uh, higher, that, excuse me, that lower pH may kill some of your uh, ribosomes or may kill some of the, uh, the positive microbes and bacteria that grow in your soil that help, you know, provide nutrients and make it easier to break down for your roots to uptake. So there's a little bit of concern about that. They don't really necessarily put how much is in their citric acids in there because citric acids also use as a, uh, basically, like I said, it eliminates uh, mold and mildew, eliminates spores on contact because it, it basically uh, kills those. So some of these things I'll see citric acid in that uh, to is a preservative or to, if it's an oil or something, you know, if oil set out too long, it can build up mold and mold and stuff will grow on oils. So I think that's maybe some of the reason they use it, but I'm seeing it more and more. And a little bit more about citric acid, it's kind of interesting though, when you had like something that's a sour type, I call it sour wang. That's something that's used in uh, citric acid is actually used in some some uh, food things or candies or stuff to give that really soury taste. So because it has a kind of a sour, bitter uh, bite to it. All right. Is that, is that where you're going with that, Mark? Yeah, no, I just, I wanted to make sure that some of the information you had, uh, I remember having pre previous conversations with, with you were also brought up in this one too, because I thought it was really fascinating around the citric acid. And I never thought of it as, as it being something that would build up. I thought of it just being as an acid, it becomes water soluble. And then it's, it's something that just passes through as simple as any other liquid nutrients. But then I was thinking it probably can dry back. It could probably have, it's a salt or some, or yeah, it could become a salt and yeah, there would be residuals. And I thought that was just something, you know, are things building up in the soil and combining with the other fertilizers that they're adding and then creating, creating some type of nutrient lockout or, or, or something or a pH yeah. imbalance. Yeah. 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 The pH balance is more, I'm, I'm not sure about the lockout, but yeah, if it's, I guess, yeah, you're right. It could, if it has, if you're make sure whole, you know, you maybe have a bunch build up in your soil and then you're pouring your, uh, your nutrient water to do your root drench. And then we all know that, uh, you know, certain pHs uh, you need to be a certain pH level so that the plants have better uptake. Certain minerals and things have to be, you know, put better uptake. That's, that's why when you see a lot of what I call the salt metal nutrients, out there um, versus some of the organic stuff. The reason they always say to have a pH of 5.5 five to 6.5 or whatever the pH recommended range is it has to do with the uptake. It has to do with the water solubility so that it can go through the, let's call it the water pressure or the uh, surface tension for the roots to uptake that particular nutrient or whatever, you know, the mixture of those nutrients. That's kind of why you see that a lot of pH in your nutrient water. Does that make sense? 100%. Absolutely. Very okay. interesting. You're, you're adding key insight into this area of stuff. You know, I don't know a lot about, so I appreciate this. And I have questions as well, like uh, a soap, most likely what the soap they're using is the sodium lauryl sulfate soap, correct? Um, probably they don't list which one it is, but I, I would imagine it's sodium lauryl sulfate um, or, you know, even, you know, I remember in the days when we would spray, put a drop of Dawn in your, and just a just RO water to spray your plants just to kind of wash them a little bit. Uh, it just lowers the surface tension as the goal with soap. Depending on the soap, I you know worry about whether it's going to build up or not. Um, you know, you want a soap that's going to break down clear. Some of the, uh, some, there's some products out there that are potassium salts and fatty acids. Those are, there's, I think there's a brand, not, I know we're talking about Lost Coast, but there's a brand called Safer Soaps. And I know that one of those challenges are that a safer soaps will leave a residue. So then you have to spray once and they work to varying degrees, but then you have to go rinse it off because you're worried about residue buildup on your leaves. So that's so, yes. Yeah, so, so it just depends on the amount of soap. It might, this might not be a big issue, but I would think they're using it for surface tension. So, so that it will um, coat the bug and coat the plant and, you know, spread a lot better, thins it out a little bit. You know, the, I, I always think about the surface tension, right? The word being used for surface tension, but then when you go to Don Soap, they use the they use the word degreaser, and I just I just like wait, hold on, I don't want to put a fucking well, degreaser on my plants. With, with, with Don, it, it has to do with um, I believe it has to do with the the static charge or whatever. Because if you have like a grease floating on the top, because we know oil and water kind of separate, especially you know when you're cooking in your uh, kitchen, um, you put a drop of Dawn, and you'll see the the oil the oil just separate because they it kind of repels like reverse magnets a little bit. Um, so that's just just kind of how that that sort of works I'm a little deep there, but 
anyway, so let me go on to isopropyl alcohol. Not sure about the use of the alcohol. It says it dehydrates rapidly. I've heard of people using, you know, alcohol mix with some water to spray on and kill some bugs. I don't know if it makes them drunk or if it just, um, it's, they say it rapidly dries them out, but you know, everybody's put alcohol in their hands. They felt the evaporation, that cooling off um, is the evaporation of the alcohol. So maybe that's what they're, they're going for on that. But you know, know one thing, one thing with the isopropyl alcohol is, which I, I don't know, but I do have controversy around it because when you look at the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol, it's like mm -hmm. 190 degrees Celsius. Oh yeah. It, it well, 190 degrees Celsius is like 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. But, but it evaporates away. And I do understand it evaporates away, but yeah. the absolute boiling point is 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And that doesn't get, it doesn't get that hot on the planet. True. There has to be residual. If there's a I point, point there is and, and how, you know, isopropyl, um, how, you know, what is it left behind? I don't know. How pure is it? You know, it's, it's those type of things. Um, it, it, you know, and how well does it mix with the water? I would have gone with um, maybe a different type of alcohol or something, but if they were going to use the alcohol, I'm sure they had a reason for it. I mean, or at least they list a reason on here for it. So everybody has a little reason for what they're doing, but that's, yeah, I agree with you on the alcohol. It's, uh, it's it, just because it works doesn't mean it's it might kill the bugs, but does it help the plant? Does it hurt the plant? You know, that type of thing. Also, it's flammable. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's flammable. I, mean, I, why, I don't want to put a flammable material on my plant. Yeah. And then sodium citrate, like we were looking at citric acid for sodium citrate is a preservative. It buffers the pH. So uh, basically it's trying to make it a little bit more stable or something. And they're saying it helps to kill um, powdery mildew is what they're basically one of the claims they're making but I, I can kind of see it as a preservative because you've got oils in here and anybody knows that's done of cooking or things that oils can eventually go rancid oils you know have a especially when they're exposed to air they'll eventually go rancid your olive oils and things like that will they don't have a forever shelf life like some people think um, so that might be helped to uh, kind of keep that under control and then we've got you know water everybody knows what water is i'm not sure what they're calling an emulsifier and a thinning agent i would look at the alcohol more as a thinning agent but, um, you know, water is in almost everything in general, and then you're going to add more water to it. So this will be the concentrated formula, and then you dilute it down. Uh, let me hit the next little thing on this, though. Let's One see. last thing real quick be, uh, on the isopropic, too, is I believe the isopropic alcohol comes from the petrochemical industry versus ethyl alcohol comes from the wheat industry. Yes. I remember straight. So yeah, the kind you drink ethyl, yeah. Why do I want pet petrochemical anything on my plant? which is another thing I kind of think about. Maybe maybe somebody's wanting to go cheers to the plant like they're having a drink while they're spraying it. I don't, anyway, let me go, let me go their instructions here. So on their instructions, um, they're saying use, uh, for infestations, use two ounces. And eventually they're saying it kills mold and mildew on contact, which I could see the alcohol doing some of that. Uh, let's see, there was something I wanted to get into in here. So little drench. They, oh, it says maybe use day of harvest. Um, I question this because there again, you're building up oils. Uh, you're building up oils on your plant. And then you're also worried about the oils clogging your stomata. Again, what a stomata does, it's on the undersides of leaves. And I believe the cannabis plant has at least like five stomatas. It's cannabis is such an older plant. It's been around for a lot longer than wheat and things in its natural state. And you can look back to medicinal things. I think in the China medicinal book, uh, like 250 years, 2000, sorry, 2000 years ago, it's been used. Uh, but anyway, the stomata gets, can be clogged by the oils because that's your gas exchange. And you want the, you know, the CO2 and the oxygen exchange to be able to flow freely. So that's why I always worry about with oils. Is it going to clog that up? Let's see what else we've got. Oh, I know. The, well, uh, there is one more thing too, right? They're allowed to make those claims because you brought up something about the 25B list. What, yeah, they're, what's they're, the difference between the both lists? There's two lists, right? Um, well, there, there, yeah, there's basically um, 25, the FIFRA 25B is a, is basically means that what's in that product is on, um, contains items off a of certain list. And that list um, is things like, you know, oils, things that are considered organic or inert substances that maybe are food grade safe or something like that. And, and don't confuse food grade safe with smoke grade safe. Because when you light something, when you put a fire to something, you're going to release a carbon and you're making it combustible. And so I, I always worry about the oils because how late did they spray oils? If I'm going to smoke something or inhale something, I would worry about um, inhaling oil. Anybody knows, you know, you don't, you know, if you've ever seen a car on fire or oil fire, you don't want to be breathing that smoke. You know, plant and vegetable oils, kind of similar. 
I kind of worry about the hydrocarbon uh, inhalation part. So, but oh, here's where I was going to go. They also say um, use early morning before the heat of the day. You want the air temperature 80 degrees or less. And that kind of goes to one, they want it to stay on there longer. But two, I think it's more about the heat and the sun that's going to burn it because of the oils will give a refraction, just like suntan oil will burn you or burn you to, to give you a suntan. You're not trying to uh, to burn and cause phytotoxicity or the necrosis or the death of the leaf. So that's why you, they, a lot of these oils will always say, here it is right here, attention, do not spray when temperatures are above 80. Um, do not use indirect sunlight and or they should say in your you know, uh, plant lights if you're indoor and then close cap tightly when not in use. Well, part of that close cap tightly not in use is one alcohol may be evaporated, but you don't want the oil to go rancid because oxygen will oxidize your oils and it won't have as long a shelf life. Let's see. Okay. Let me get, let me hit the next little thing on, on lost coast. So this is their SDS um, safety data sheet. It used to be called MSDS uh, manufacturer safety data sheet. And they upgraded it the format to just SDS. So this has some hazardous warnings on this. It has a uh, high flammability of liquid and vapor. We've got alcohol. Everybody knows alcohol will burn at a high enough dose. Oil you know, burns once it catches fire. It doesn't explode, but it can be burned. And then uh, that could be a serious eye irritant. So of all the, uh, the ingredients in here, we've got, you don't want to get you don't want to get isopropyl alcohol in your eyes. You don't want to get sodium citrate in your eyes either. And you certainly don't want to get citric acid in your eyes because you know it has a pH of four. So it'll burn and peppermint oil. That's not going to be good in your eyes either. Maybe not even good on your skin if anybody's ever got it directly in their skin. So it could have serious eye damage. Um, and then the skin irritation there, there again, citric acid, low pH can be acidic. So it can burn you. Not sure how it may cause you drowsiness or dizziness, but uh, this was just some of the hazardous. Always look to see how safe is it. If it's not that safe for you, I worry about the safety of the environment too. Now, maybe the eye thing might be about the soap, but um, this is serious eye damage. So it must be the corrosive properties of the pH. That's what I have on this one. Holt, I love you, man. Um, this is phenomenal because you're, you're, you've spent so much time in the pesticide fungicide area that for me, like myself, when I'm looking at it just once or twice, I would have skipped over flam, a flammable or corrosive. It would, of course, I know these things, but I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been a registered thought. And to ask myself, is this something I want to put on my herb plants? Again, there, are, there these products, there are good and bads for all of them. And you, you, for proper application and on the proper types of crops, these products will work well. But yes. for this industry and the industry we're, we're talking about, the canning industry, we have to have a higher consciousness thought to the yes. application for our end consumers. Absolutely. It's, it's the inputs. I mean, inputs are going to be, you know, what type of soil you're going to use and your nutrients, your everything that goes that you're putting on your plant or in the soil around your plant or feeding your plant. Those are your inputs. And so, yeah, you need to be really conscious, especially if your main focus is I want to be organic and safe and environmentally friendly and, you know, people plant it plant safe. Um, like we say, our product is you, you want to uh, definitely you know, consider those things. And I appreciate the, the compliment. It's just been for the last uh, 10 years, I've kind of been studying this as we were working on our product to bring it to market is I was looking at, um, you know, it's not what the claims are. It's uh, not even how pretty and cartoonish the commercials and labels are. It's what's in it. And so at the end of the day, you know, I'm an ingredients person. I look and see what's in it. And I've studied a lot of the ingredients to understand what maybe they're possibly using this for. What, what, you know, what's the use of this and the goods and the bads and why they may use this. They might have gone with some ingredient that was cheaper, that maybe an ex more expensive ingredient would be, be better, but it was a cost factor. Who knows the reasoning? But, um, you know, that, that's just kind of where my knowledge comes from. It's not that I'm a scientist or anything. It's just more I'm uh, a consumer and uh, just really dig into the, the knowledge of that. So I understand to you know, educate myself and I'm happy to share it with everyone else. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember to like, share and subscribe only on Perfect Gardens TV. Have a great grow, everyone. We're going to be getting started in a new grow series. I'm very excited to get this one started. Not only are we going to be popping some awesome new genetics, but we're also going to be kicking off the series using the Mars Hydro FCE 6500 bar style light with manual dimmer switch. And this thing is pumping out a whopping 720 watts from the wall. 